Thank you. So a uh, great crowd on a chilly morning. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a off the road topic, uh, but I thought it's um, important that we discuss uh, this issue. And I think it's becoming more and more important uh, in today's day and age. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the hospital sleep medicine. Uh, some of you may not even be familiar with this concept as we go forward. I'll explain the background, why we are here, and uh, why uh, this is uh, gaining more traction. Next slide, please. So um, objectively today, in the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, I wanted to kind of highlight some of the issues with sleep disorder breathing, especially the prevalence, understand why hospital sleep medicine is playing an important role now, and review some current data on hospital sleep medicine. And next slide, please. Uh, so just a very basics on sleep disorder breathing. This is a not uh, a full lecture on sleep disorder breathing. I think Dr. Stansbury has already talked in detail about it. Um, but in general, what, what is happening in obstructive sleep apnea is that you're collapsing the posterior part of your throat intermittently throughout the night, as opposed to central sleep apnea where you're forgetting to breathe. So there are two important differences over here. Surprisingly, uh, despite very, very different etiology and pathogenesis, the severity is calculated at the same scale, which I've still not understood why, but uh, anything less than five is considered normal, five to 15 is mild, and five to 30 is moderate. And anytime you quit breathing, more than 30 times an hour is considered severe for both cases. Next slide, please. So why is sleep disorder breathing important for regular uh, physicians, specialists, healthcare professionals? But one thing we have learned over the last 30 uh, years is that very strong association of sleep disorder breathing with arrhythmias, sudden death, hypertension, CHF, COPD, MI, stroke, and permeable hypertension. And I believe I'd don't have anybody that I heard of in the crowd who hasn't dealt with any of these uh, devastating comorbidities uh, while practicing. So it's kind of a perfect storm and an engine which drives many of these comorbidities. Next slide, please. So the other aspect, which is uh, not very well known to uh, the people is how prevalent this disease is. For example, this is a very recent study by Adam Benjafield from Australia, uh, who looked at the entire world and different countries and looked at the prevalence of sleep disorder breathing and came up with the number of a billion people, a billion people with sleep disorder breathing. Uh, this by uh, the number, sheer number, uh, completely overwhelms uh, hypertension, diabetes, and even COVID. Uh, in, in its, uh, as far as the prevalence is concerned. So uh, a lot of time people are surprised at this number, but this is uh, the, the problem with this, medic this disease is this is very less known and people just don't know about this disease. Next slide, please. So it also has a significant uh, cost on uh, the society. Uh, this is a really nice paper where they involve not only physicians, but economists, and they found out that uh, just the United States, and this is not even the world, it costs almost $50 billion, uh, to treat, manage, and undiagnosed sleep apnea. Next, next slide, please. So how do we address these uh, icebergs uh, below the surface? So despite all the things you have heard of in the sleep world, sleep specialists, sleep labs, home sleep study, PSC, we are barely touching the surface as far as the diagnosis uh, and recognition of this disease. So the bigger problem still remains, uh, you know, uh, under the water like an iceberg, and we don't know how to address it. There's a great paper by Jawa Hiri a few years ago, which looked at all the patients with heart failure 
And they found that 70% of people with heart failure have this underlying disease called sleep disorder breathing, but only 2% of them have been diagnosed. So again, same theme that whether you take deadly disease like heart failure or any other issues, we are just not doing a good job diagnosing and recognizing this disease. Next slide, please. So uh, about a decade ago, when I started looking into this issue, one of the things which was very odd when I looked at this issue was that while all of these bad actors, which we just mentioned, the hypertension, the, the myocardial infarction, CHF, stroke, are all seen in high concentration in a hospital setting, almost universally sleep doctors are found practicing in a suburban clinic area. So I thought that there was a real dichotomy that even sleep physicians didn't understand that they're the wrong side of where you, they need to be as far as addressing this issue. And I often used to, uh, to say in my lectures in the past that uh, this is like uh, having a war in Iraq and you're sending troops to Canada. It just doesn't make sense. Next slide, please. So this is uh, about a decade ago, I wrote this um, commentary in JCSM and you know you can go ahead and read on your own, but this is the argument I was trying to make at the time to, to, that my mind is you know, unable to comprehend why despite knowing all these facts, the way we are acting. And of course there were some logical reasons for that, including financial and things like that. Uh, but that's where I started having interest uh, in this area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so it's one thing to, to address this issue in public. The other is, what are we going to do about it? So one of the things I had to, to think about is that, yes, I am thinking that there's a problem in a hospital, but do we have any data? Do we know this problem really exists or is all in my mind? The other problem, which I think a lot of physicians pointed out to me is that, you know, we may be quasi aware of this, but what do you do about it? There is no cost-effective way to identify. You can't do a $2,000 study on every patient who comes into the hospital. And I think that was a very genuine question and a genuine uh, thought uh, over there that how do you even do that? And of course, what is the effective intervention uh, that part I was le less worried about because I think CPAP therapy and other non vasoventilations ventilations uh, has been uh, shown to be effective treatment of that. But even if we did all of this and proved this data, uh, the biggest problem was, does it make a difference? If you make this huge investment and you say this is a major issue that we need to address, does it make a difference? What, what does difference mean? You know, to, to us physicians, sometimes different means, you know, less mortality, readmission rate, better health. And I think those are some core um, issues that uh, we need to focus on. So next slide, please. So uh, the first thing we looked at is, well, there are a lot of these questionnaires. A lot of you may have even heard about it, the STOP questionnaire, the STOP bang. You ask a bunch of questions from a patient and he say yay or nay, and then that you decide whether he's got sleep disorder breathing or not. But we, when we really looked at it, we found that their sensitivity and specificity was very poor. We're talking of a specificity of 53 and 43% in these questionnaires. So that kind of led us to the fact that there'll be a huge waste of resources trying to ask everybody in the hospital when half the time, you may be wrong. So uh, this didn't seem to us like the logical way to approach. Next slide. So we decided to explore some technology, a little uh, history over here, as far as uh, pulse oximetry concerned. Uh, some of you probably may not know that pulse oximetry was not originally developed as a medical device. It was, de uh, it was developed uh, during World War II when the planes were getting better, they could go higher. And they started noticing that a lot of these planes were just falling off the sky uh, like flies. And they couldn't figure out what's wrong with the planes. 
And uh, then they realized there was nothing wrong with the planes. It was the pilot who was uh, losing consciousness. And um, some bright guy figured out that the oxygen may be very low up in the atmosphere and that's what's happening. And then some engineer in, in um, uh, Germany made this device which could actually measure your oxygen up there in the height. And they would send these boxes along. Uh, there, there was like 30 pound boxes at that time as a pulse oximetry to go with a pilot. And as soon as the oxygen starts hitting before 90, they were asked to come down on the altitude. And that saved a whole bunch of people's life. It wasn't until 1970s that the doctors started thinking, well, if the pilots can use it, maybe we can use it in our hospitals too. Uh, in fact, even before the adult doctors were the peds doctors who realized that uh, it's important in the hospital. And that's how it came into the medical territory. So why am I saying and telling you about the story about World War II over here? Well, one of the reason is that we, we use pulse oximetry very, very um, uh, you know, closely in, in these patients with sleep disorder breathing as part of the polysomnography. One of uh, the devices we use is pulse oximetry. And the way it is integrated in a diagnosis of sleep disorder breathing is this, anytime you quit breathing, your oxygen will drop, right? You, because your throat doesn't open up, you're not breathing uh, environmental oxygen, and suddenly your tissues will not get oxygen. So by definition, according to American Academy of Sleep Medicine, if you drop your oxygen for 3%, that means that you quit in breathing. Uh, CMS defines that by 4% drop in oxygen. Anyhow, we took that as surrogate evidence of sleep apnea, especially if it happened in an intermittent fashion. Next slide, please. So the problem with the traditional pulse oximetry was that when uh, the signal is uh, transmitted to the, the finger, and it goes through the blood and it uh, gets differentially absorbed by the oxygenated versus the deoxygenated blood. There's a lot of signals get that pass through that finger. Um, to give you an example, there are about 600 signals per second. So obviously the human mind cannot make any sense of these kind of signals. So what the engineers did was they averaged the signal out over 20 seconds. So that that would make sense to them. So that's why we couldn't use this in sleep apnea because the defi by definition sleep apnea, it's a cessation of breathing for 10 seconds. And if you're averaging out for 20 seconds, you would lose all these intermittent hypoxemic episodes. There was another problem in the beginning that if we tried to make these signals uh, more accurate or reduce the time of this um, uh, sampling, what happened was significant artifacts started coming up. So there were frequencies which were starting to infiltrate, which were not necessarily true signals. We call that signal to noise ratio. And the signal to noise ratio continues to reduce, you will not get optimal results. So there were a couple of technological challenges at that time where we weren't able to use it to its fullest use. Next slide, please. And then uh, over the last uh, decade or so, we were able to overcome these technological barriers by producing what is called as the high resolution pulse ox. And the high resolution pulse ox, you were able to sample the signal to as low as two seconds and then have a certain bandwidth filter, which could filter all these unnecessary uh, signals, which we call the artifactual signals, uh, and we were still able to make sense, meaningful sense out of it. So this graph kind of tells you what happens when you reduce the sampling time from a traditional Walmart picked up pulse oximetry of 20 seconds to a high resolution pulse oximetry of two seconds or less. So on the bottom where you see the circle over here, is your regular pulse oximetry from Walmart. And you can see that when it averages, this is your average is coming out to be 90%. But 
But when you take the filter off and you make it three seconds, just like on the top one, you can start seeing the oxygen desaturation going all the way to 70%. So this is what's missed in what's available to you right now, why this is not that yeah, popular out there is because you missed all of these signals. So we took this as, uh, as, as one of uh, the technologies which could really help us bridge the gap, which we were finding ourselves uh, specifically in uh, the hospitalized situation. Next slide, please. So what we decided was what if we could combine this objective testing of high resolution pulse ox with a questionnaire. Now you remember that the questionnaire does have a high sensitivity. So that's like you throw in a net, a wide net, but then following it out with the high resolution pulse ox, which is so specific, they will pick up all of these signals. So that means you have both high sensitivity and high specificity. And we combine this to, to call it a dual or two steps or two tier screening testing, which meant the patient got a sleeping questionnaire. And then all of those questionnaires who people were positive for underwent this oximetry while admitted into the hospital with their condition, whichever it was. Next slide. So the question was, okay, we figured out a certain way, we got the technology, we fine tuned it to high resolution pulse ox and whatnot but will this work? Next slide, please. So this is the first attempt we made to see whether this thing works. We screened a total of 754 consecutive people admitted to the hospital. And we screened them again with a stop questionnaire and then followed them immediately with a high resolution pulse ox the same night. And we figured out that it is a bunch of people who we've identified as high risk for sleep disorder breathing. These people within two days of discharge of home underwent a gold standard polysomnography to compare uh, our cheap technology to the polysomnography. Next slide, please. And lo and behold, we found that there was an 87% match. So we were right 87% of the time with this very cheap technology to address sleep disorder breathing. And this slide basically shows that if we screened people in a hospitalized set setting, there was a significant number of people we identified within just one year. And majority of them turned out to be moderate to severe. So it was a very high yield intervention uh, in, in our minds. This again was followed with several other uh, trials which showed very similar results. Next slide, please. So this is a trial which we did here in uh, West Virginia. West Virginia um, has its unique challenges. You know, one of the challenges is morbid obesity. Number two challenge is uh, the problem they have poor access to healthcare, poor literacy. Uh, so we don't know whether the same device and the same concept would work in a rural setting. So these are people who are admitted in a hospitalized setting and they undergo a home sleep testing, which is approved by CMS and an our cheap high resolution pulse ox, which is seen uh, right here on your left. Same night while they're admitted in the hospital. And look at the results. They're almost overlapping. So the apnea link or the home sleep study was uh, almost overlapping with our cheap device. And uh, the area under the curve uh, was very high with the uh, uh, accuracy of, of, of over 92%. So we knew that this device works here in uh, rural settings too. Next slide, please. All right, so um, I think the first part was uh, we were pretty satisfied considering these are only few studies I'm showing you, but there were many others which we did to, uh, to prove this. But I think we were still not clear in our minds whether this technology, this cheap cost-effective technology, does it make a difference uh, in the outcome? So next slide, please. 
So I'm going to walk you through a, a, a reasonably common scenario, which most of you may have uh, encountered. And then I'm going to follow as to what happened after that. So uh, let's take the case of congestive heart failure. This is the number one condition for, for which patients get admitted to the hospital throughout the United States, including West Virginia. So let's start, uh, talk about this case. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a real-time case of 58-year-old, which we had admitted for shortness of breath, which had been worsening over the last two months. He had reported lower extremity edema, which had been getting worse, dry, cough, generalized weakness, the nice fever, night sweats. He had the usual comorbidities of hypertension, heart failure, and CAD and was on usual medications of lisinopril, metoropropol, uh, Lasix, and aspirin. And on exam, he had significant edema and SATs of 86% on room air, which necessitated admission to the hospital. Not a scenario which none of you would not be familiar with. So a very common scenario, congested, exaggerated congested heart failure. We see it in all settings, small hospitals, big hospitals across the nation. Next slide, please. Labs were uh, pretty normal, except the creatinine was creeping up because I think his doctor at home had asked him to go up on his Lasix uh, to see if we can prevent hospital readmission. The NP was uh, off the roof because he was in exaggeration. Chest X-ray was very suggestive of pulmonary edema and his echo was suggestive of continuing congestive heart failure with EF of 40% and pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 50 millimeter of mercury. Again, not an uncommon situation. Next slide. So that's his chest X-ray and I apologize, probably uh, not a very good quality one, but if you carefully look at it, uh, it does show, does show interstitial pulmonary edema type of markings and is very reminiscent of a exaggeration of congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema in acute setting. Next slide, please. So despite giving him all the IV uh, Lasix and, and the treatment for blood pressure control, uh, he was not experiencing any improvement in shortness of breath. Again, a common finding in these patients with heart failure who stay in the hospital for sometimes many, many days before they get better. One of the downsides of, of uh, bombarding them with uh, Lasix and diuretics and water pills is their kidney starts taking a hit. So a patient who's already on borderline renal failure, you could see the creatinine rising 1.3 to 1.8 because we have flog in a dead horse. Sometimes these people have intravascular depletion and yet they're getting a lot of Lasix. Next slide, please. So what do you do in this kind of situation? So we brought our technology out of uh, the cupboard and said, listen, maybe we can help. So on your left side, what you see is a kind of a report uh, a quick and dirty report, which we generate from our high resolution pulse ox, and it's called a waveform analysis. The top of part of the waveform analysis is your oxygen levels, and the bottom is your heart rate. And you can see from this uh, report that the patient is having significant nocturnal desaturation uh, of almost about 52 minutes throughout the night, and he's quitting breathing about 65 times an hour. So this is fairly good evidence based on all the data which we had generated in the past that the patient has severe underlying sleep disorder breathing, which is undiagnosed and being untreated. And again, as I said, in our mind, this is the engine which is driving the heart failure. So we immediately started the patient overnight on non-invasive ventilation. And then uh, next slide, please. And to confirm, the next day we repeated the high resolution pulse ox and you can see, lo and behold, the oxygen desaturation is completely resolved. He has no significant oxygen desaturation. And if you look at the, uh, the, the graph down below uh, of oxygen desaturation index, it's down from 65 to 11. So very severe sleep apnea now uh, down to very mild levels. And lo and behold, the patient improved, his shortness of breath got better, oxygenation got better, 
his need for diuretics reduced, and he was discharged from the home. So the question came to us is, these are isolated cases which we are looking at. What if we did a big trial and just saw, saw that what happens in a bigger picture? Uh, next slide, please. So this is the first trial that was done by us where we looked at intervention of positive air pressure therapy on readmission of hospitalized patients with heart failure. And uh, we looked at people who were compliant and we looked for almost six months post discharge. The reason we wanted to do that, that was we wanted to see whether this was just a very temporary intervention which would maybe prevent one or two admission or does it have long lasting impact? Does it change the natural history of the disease? And what we found was that it significantly reduced not only hospital re readmission, but also emergency uh, room visits in these patients with congestive heart failure who were identified in the hospital. Intervention started while they were in the hospital and they went home with that intervention. And that lasted almost uh, for six months period of time. So this was not a short-term effect. This definitely was something that uh, uh, we looked at as, as a positive outcome in terms of patient readmission. Next slide, please. Very much uh, unknown to us across the street at University of Pennsylvania, they were there do doing their own testing and they figured out that patients who were discharged from CCU, that they were so bad that they had to be in a critical care cardiac unit who were discharged on an RCPAP at home had a reduction in 30 day readmission. So kind of these are two, two studies hitting uh, the press almost at the same time, one showing 30 day readmission reduction, which is very important from CMS point of view. And then our study, which said it is not just short term, but long term benefit to almost readmission rate reducing for six months and above. Next slide, please. So the question uh, comes in, yes, heart failure is a great thing, but you know what? In West Virginia, we have a lot of COPD. We have a lot of smokers. And not only is just the numbers important, but it's important because we have the highest number of readmissions in the entire country for COPD. We also also have the highest number of deaths from COPD than the entire country. So what, what, what are we doing about that? Next slide, please. So here's a study which we did and said, if congestive heart failure can have such a huge impact with sleep disorder breathing, what is the role of COPD? The role of COPD was a little more tricky because before we came up with this study, uh, people were on the fence. There were some studies showing, well, sleep disorder breathing is not really very uh, prevalent in COPD. And some people had actually shown that the prevalence of sleep disorder breathing in COPD was no higher than a regular population, okay? So some people had just kind of put that in a dustbin. This is the first study, very large scale study published in CHEST, where we showed that 50% of the people admitted to the hospital with COPD exacerbation actually have an underlying sleep disorder breathing. Not only that, based on the severity of the sleep apnea, a comprehensive output, which was determined as readmission versus death, was influencing these patients. So in essence, if you had sleep disorder breathing, you had more chances of readmission and death after your discharge from the hospital for COPD exacerbation. And not only that, it depended on the severity of sleep apnea. The higher the sleep apnea AHI number, the more chances of you having a readmission or a death. So this was kind of the first time of direct correlation uh, was seen in this patient. Next slide, please. And we did a very similar study to heart failure. We said, okay, you are being discharged home with COPD exacerbation. You have an underlying sleep disorder breathing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start treating you at home at the time of discharge from home and see what happens over the next six months period of time. And we, we, we basically were looking at two groups. One is, hey, listen, this is important for you. You go home on this machine 
and this will prevent you from having any bad impact. Some people followed it, others not. So we had a 50-50 group, others says, thank you very much, my COPD is much better, I don't want to be used in this. Okay. So this is a competitive trial between people who used it and who didn't use it. And you can see there was significant number of readmissions in patients who did not use it, despite having the diagnosis at the time of discharge, as compared to people who used it, who showed significant reduction in both readmission in the hospital and emergency room visits. So very similar duplicate copy. And this is over six months period of time. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a very interesting paper a bit by Mayo Clinic that obstructive sleep apnea is not only responsible for you getting sicker over many, many years by giving heart failure, hypertension, and all those bad things, but in certain cases, it can cause you sudden cardiac death uh, at night. So we looked at it and we said, listen, in the hospital, sometimes we come in the morning and we are told that this patient had a cardiac arrest in the middle of the night and is no longer here, uh, which many times surprises us, shocks us. So we decided to see whether that sleep disorder breathing is playing a role in that. Uh, next slide, please. We took sudden death uh, as, uh, you know, we, we can't take deaths because that would be a huge study. So we took a surrogate marker or rapid response events, which is when a such a report is triggered in the hospital, everybody rushes in, tries to stabilize the patient, escalates to ICU, uh, and, and not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, results in a death. But this is a reportable event by every hospital nationally called the rapid response event. So we took that as a surrogate marker and we looked at all the patients we had screened in the hospital as to what happens to them. And lo and behold, Patients who were labeled as high risk obstructive sleep apnea had a significant high rapid response events in the hospital as compared to patients who were considered low risk by our definition um, and screening devices. So we didn't leave this as at here. We said, if this is a case, that's a problem. Not a problem just for our hospital, but a problem across the country. So we said, now that we have already screened them, we know it is high risk, why don't we do some intervention while they're in the hospital, see what happens? So this is the same study going forward. Next slide, please. Where we placed all these patients on CPAP machines preemptively and then looked at the RRT events and you can see there was significant reduction, significant reduction in rapid response events in the patients who were treated and accepted the treatment. And the high bar which shows continued to have high RRT is the patients who refuse CPAP in the hospital or denied that they, they would want to use that. So this kind of gave us a good glimpse that this could have both an acute and a chronic protective effect if we introduce this um, in our hospitals across the country. Next slide, please. So uh, this is one of the largest studies uh, that I know of in the world which looked at 5,000 patients cum cumulatively who were admitted in the hospital, which we published, and then followed them for three years down the road and see what happened to those patients who were discharged home on CPAP and were compliant as opposed to who were told that you got this problem and yet were non-compliant. And this is the first uh, study that's shown that there's actually mortality benefit down the stream. And there was significant survival improvement in patients who remain compliant after discharge uh, three years down the road. Next slide, please. So based on all this accumulated data, uh, the chest had asked us to write down an article as to how we do it. And this is gonna be coming in a day or two in chest. So it's really hard off the press. And if you want some more extra details on how we do this program, how we run it, uh, this is all articulated in this uh, art in this um, publication due to be uh, out in the next couple of days. Next slide, please. And based on this data, not only just our data, because I, a dearth of time, I did not present all the data to you, but based on everything which is coming out, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has formed a task force now to look at inpatient sleep disorder breathing guidelines. Uh, which I have the honor to be part of. Next slide, please. 
So uh, I wanted to thank our wonderful team at Ruby in West Virginia, which made this possible. Uh, you know, that includes our respiratory therapists, sleep physicians, nurse practitioners, and of course, the people who utilize the service, as you can see, hospitalists are the number one people who use our services, followed by internal medicine and cardiology. And um, uh, just by last week, we had already uh, screened and diagnosed 1,500, 1500 patients just in Ruby in the last uh, one to one and a half uh, years period of time. So um, I uh, want to congratulate them and thank them for this uh, effort. Uh, and hopefully what we want to do is uh, we want to take this technology, cheap technology out and spread it out to the entire West Virginia so everybody can benefit from it. Next slide, please. So just uh, as I promised Dr. Doyle that I will finish in time so that he can have time to have his announcements. I'll uh, finish now and take any questions if you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. That's incredible work that you and your team are doing. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing all that with us. Also love the chipmunk picture at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did get a question in the chat. So we'll um, start off with that and then we'll go into any other questions other folks might have. Um, Grace Ann chatted in saying, Dr. Sharma, this research is astonishing. Are you still using high resolution pulse ox um, and screening questionnaire routinely on hospital patients? Absolutely. I just showed that last slide. This is an active program here in Ruby. And uh, <clears throat> we, we uh, continue to expand the services. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our Fairmont Hospital will be adopting the service. And this is very important for us because, you know, a lot of people think this is a tertiary care problem or you have all this technology, you can use it, but we want to take it as a small hospital at Fairmont and tell them that this technology can work anywhere and you really don't need too much of expertise of technology once you know how to use it. Thank you so much. Uh, Grace Ann, did you want to ask uh, any follow-up questions or expand on that in any way? Um, I, I just wrote in the chat box, bravo, Dr. Sharma. Um, Thank you, Grace. I'm delighted that this will be done then at, at Fairmount Hospital. What I'm wondering is, are you still continuing any of the research specifically on COPD patients because your, your small group um, subgroup it with COPD, it showed some very promising results. That's an excellent question, Grace. Uh, this is an area of high importance to us. Um, are we heavily invested in continuing research? Absolutely. Um, where, has there been some roadblocks to it? Yes, this last two years with us being bombarded with COVID, and uh, being uh, you know, very, very busy in the ICU trying to save lives, that took a little bit of a backseat. Uh, but as, as we see COVID receding, hopefully, crossing our fingers in the, in the rear view mirror, we are jumping back and uh, we are reviewing all the data of 1,500 patients which we have screened and uh, placed them on uh, CPAP therapy. And we are also designing some upcoming trials, which we'd be addressing some of these major concerns and, uh, uh, you know, understanding the dynamics of COPD and sleep disorder breathing much more in the context of West Virginia uh, rather than, than national. So we are, we are very, very focused on that as a part of our commitment to health, um, uh, you know, disparities in West Virginia. I have just one follow-up question. Are you seeing sleep disordered breathing in long haul COVID patients? That's another fantastic question. And I wish I had answers to all of these wonderful questions, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's something that is very much in our thoughts. We have designed thought, uh, some thoughtful studies regarding it. There was one study where we looked at sleep in patients who uh, had COVID and Dr. Uh, Stansbury and, and his group showed that there's a significant disruption of sleep uh, in patients who had undergone 
COVID admission in the hospital. And there are some studies nationally, which has showed that there is increased amount of sleep disorder breathing in these patients. And then sleep apnea, having presence of sleep apnea actually predisposes you to having more COVID or more likelihood to have COVID. So there, there are some suggestions that these may be related, but we haven't had any uh, opportunity, at least in the West Virginia, to study this, uh, but this is also on the plate. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, questions, Grace Ann. Uh, Dr. Stansbury, I noticed you unmuted, and uh, Dr. Doyle as well. Did either of you have questions or comments? Mitra, there's a question here, uh, I think, by Johnny Mullins. Did you utilize the stop bang sleep apnea questionnaire or another form? So yes, uh, uh, Johnny, we, uh, we basically utilize stop and stop bang. And uh, the reason for that is that the only questionnaire in the whole wide world, which has been actually validated to, for by, to be used by the person without being administered. So a patient can fill it out and has the same validity as if you ask. So it kind of reduces the amount of burden. So remember that we are not doing this program just for ourselves. Eventually we want to roll it out that anybody can do that. That this is nothing uh, sp special to our program. So we want to use tools which can be easily used outside. So that's one of the reasons we use STOP is because it can be self administered. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Johnny. Any other questions, comments? If we have a quick second, I could share my screen. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing that's really frame it for everybody, we just, um, you know, actually came out this month in the journal clinical sleep medicine. We just looked at the Medicaid uh, population. Can you guys see that? Yes. And how yes. we're doing in West Virginia. This is, um, you know, what our estimated prevalence would be. And, you know, based on billing codes, how we're doing identifying it. Um, so as you can see, we actually do pretty good in COPD, but really under-recognized sleep disorder breathing in West Virginia. And we did a follow-up study where we kind of look to get the thoughts, beliefs, this is actually in review, um, and understanding of primary care providers in West Virginia, kind of what their thoughts on sleep apnea are. Um, Dr. Doyle was very helpful with this. Um, so thank you, Dr. Doyle. He also suggested looking at, um, you know, prevalence in these small southern rural communities. And you can see when you look at sort of the specific sites in Southern West Virginia, where you, you know, obesity is rampant and so are, you know, a lot of these other health problems. The only 2% of um, folks were carrying a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So we certainly have a lot of work to do. Um, very interesting in this study, all the providers based on a questionnaire thought OSA is an extremely important disorder, but had really no co minimal confidence in identifying or managing sleep apnea. So that's another interesting finding. So that's another piece of the puzzle our group's working on. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Stansbury. That's really incredible. Uh, Dr. Doyle, I noticed you raised your hand. Yes, um, I try to think of questions that will um, prompt other questions and and especially from our APHP sites. And I noticed that on this call, we have, I think, four rural hospitals, two in Pennsylvania and two in West Virginia. And I would like to ask the rural hospitals to comment on um, if they're seeing this and, and the extent to which they are using um, non-invasive, um, non-invasive support, uh, treatment of sleep apnea in, in patients who are admitted to the hospital, CHF patients, COPD exacerbation patients, and also um, how you think you're doing at making sure that people who are already using um, CPAP at home get to continue that while they're in the hospital. So, so the rural hospitals we have here are Pocahontas, 
Um, let's see, we got another rural hospital. Oh, uh, well, anyway, we got at least Pocahontas and also Barnes Casson and, and Armstrong in Pennsylvania. So any comment from you all about how you are identifying and using um, sleep support for your patients in the hospital? This is Dean Gunner from Pocahontas Memorial Hospital. Uh, we, we routinely use the, the pulse oximetry. Um, and I, I think we average, uh, we're doing about, I'd say we do six overnights a week. That doesn't sound like a lot when you're considering, but we're 25 bed critical access hospital. So, you know, um, that, that's in hospital six. Out of hospital, I don't, I'm, I'm not even sure how many we're doing there because Dr. Durham's heavily involved in sleep up here. So um, we have a large trucking population here. So most of those guys are obligated to have sleep studies regularly. So we do have a lot of patients that come into the hospital with uh, their, their own BiPAPs and CPAPs in, in tow. Our, uh, we have a hospital policy where we use their machine when possible. It has to go through the biomed process, but otherwise then we use theirs because we don't have, especially with COVID right now, we haven't had enough machines to go around to take care of everybody that comes in. And then also the challenges with Phillips in general with uh, everything, it seems like it's constantly recalled there. Right now we've got recalls on our B60s, but uh, um, that's, that's pretty much where we're at. Uh, we really try to identify these people as I, don't know. I think we do a pretty good job of that actually here. But like I said, that's that's largely due to we, we've got an endemic population. We've got a trucking company right here in Pocahontas County that I mean, those that's one of our major employers here. So um, we have to kind of cater to those guys. How about Preston? Dr. Doyle, this is Terry. Um, we do use the um, pulse ox, like we send the patient home with those to do overnight pulse ox, but we have a sleep lab also that if that study comes back and they need to go in for an overnight sleep study, they schedule that at the sleep lab to do that. And I'm not sure right offhand how many we send out in a month's time. I know there for a while, um, we did have like two or three going out every month. But most of the time with our Royal, with the Royal Hospital and stuff that the insurance companies also like for that in-home pulse ox, like the sleep study done prior to coming into the lab to have that done. They want that step taken, taken first before they bring them into the lab. And, you, and this is Dr. Sela. I'm, I'm probably reading um, probably six to eight overnight oximetries a week, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. Thank you, Dr. Sela. I didn't have any of that information here at home with me, so I figured maybe you would know yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Any, uh, Terry, a quick question. Any particular reason why the sleep labs require you to do an overnight pulse ox before the study? What was that, sir? Uh, I just want to, I, I think I heard you say that the sleep center requires you to do an overnight pulse oximetry before the sleep study. Did no, I a, lot of, a lot of times the insurance companies want I you see. to rule that out and do that first before bringing them into the sleep lab and do an over, like an overnight stay. Um, yeah. And that's why it's, you know, the totals I think are increasing because they want to rule it out the in, the in home prior to bringing them into the lab first. And, and just to make uh, sure this is not the home sleep study, this is the overnight pulse ox you're talking because this is just a screening process. It doesn't rule it out. For CMS, you need a home sleep study to actually diagnose or rule it out at home. Dr. Sela, could you give more information on that? Because I'm not sure what Shauna actually hands out. So um, 
so a lot of times what we're seeing is that the insurance company is preferring a home sleep study um, before they bring them into the lab. Um, so we're doing that. Now, personally, in my practice, it's sometimes it's a tough sell to get patients to agree to go for a sleep study. And so sometimes I do um, do an overnight oximetry before we send them for a sleep study. But no, I, I haven't seen requirements for overnight oximetry prior to doing a sleep study, at least not anything recently. Thank you. Uh, uh, Benedict or Joseph or um, Aaron, any anything from your hospitals, how you're dealing with this there in Pennsylvania? I, this is Joe. Um, we're not doing too much of that here at night. I don't actually have the numbers because somebody else um, works the department. Thank you all so much for sharing. That's very helpful, really hearing what you all are doing and your experiences have been. Any other comments, questions? We have about five minutes here. I know uh, Dr. Dole, you wanted to uh, mention a little bit of something at the end here too. So we'll make time for that as well. Um, hello, this is, give me a second. Hello, this is, this is uh, Carl Warren. So I have a quick question. Um, one of the things that he said really interested me in the talk, um, although it was, it, was, it was a background thing, but it was interesting. You mentioned that COPD is, is more prevalent here in West Virginia. And I'm really curious, um, given the kind of work that I do, if, well, A, what, how you de what your definition of C is of COPD, because that still baffles me. But the second question was, um, if, if anybody's done any work with the etiology of the COPD, for example, is, um, you know, is, are the, do we have, is, is it all smoking or is black lung part of this or which, which version of COPD are we talking about? That was my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think these are all epidemi epidemiological studies, uh, large scale done by CDC. And uh, most of them are dependent on spirometry uh, diagnosis of uh, your FEV1 to FVC ratio. So uh, not necessarily including the restrictive component of uh, coal miners disease or uh, pneumoconiosis, but uh, you're right that the two can coexist. Uh, there's uh, definitely an overlap, specifically in West Virginia, of the two disorders. Um, having said that, I think that that just makes things worse, not any better. So, so to me, even if you had a patient who has COPD with an additional pneumoconiosis, the fact that there's an underlying sleep disorder breathing, which is causing further desaturation every night, uh, to me, that's just you know, even uh, worse outcome uh, in terms of uh, cardiovascular diseases than if you just had one. Uh, but yes, I, I know that the diagnosis of COPD sometimes uh, can be confusing. Many times it can be made based on chest x-rays, CT scans, sometimes not even on spirometry, just on a, a you know, basis of clinical exam or wheezing and heavy cigarette smoking in the absence of other things. So yes, it's, it's, it's not a very clear cut diagnosis, but based on the heavy smoking, which we know in West Virginia, uh, that uh, there definitely is, is a trend of high COPD. Uh, but I think to, to me, more telling is the, the data that we have more readmissions or admissions to the hospitals and more deaths due to that. And I think that additional layering of this pneumoconiosis is uh, probably what uh, uh, makes that happen. So, so hope that answers your question there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharma and uh, Dr. Wurns for that question. Uh, we're getting some chats in as well. Thanking you, Dr. Sharma. This was such a wonderful session and uh, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences and what you're working on and all of that. So um, thank you again so much. And we'll definitely be looking forward to next time you present.
Um, we do have just about a minute left, Dr. Doyle, if you wanted to take time, take your time to um, say your announcement as well. So no rush at all. But. <laughs> okay, all right, no rush at all. Just do it in under 30 seconds. Um, um, I just want to recognize the GAD PRP APHP sites that showed up today, which included Cabin Creek, Man with Johnny and Sheila, uh, Preston, Terry and Allison, thank you very much. Pocahontas, Charles and Dean, they already jumped off and also the Pennsylvania sites and remind people that this Friday, April 8th, 8 a.m. we have an RT quarterly meeting. That's it, Mitra. Thank you so much, Dr. Doyle. And uh, if you want me to distribute anything via email as well, feel free to email me. Um, what, what, I would, what I would like you to distribute is the, out, the upcoming paper by Dr. Sharma that he mentioned that's coming out right now and distribute a link that, or give us a PDF so that when we go to the link, we don't get told we have to subscribe to the journal because we'd really like to see that. Absolutely. I'll reach out to him and see if we can get that for you all. Thank you. Uh, my only announcement is that our next session will be on April 18th, and uh, Dr. Roby will be presenting on diagnosis and treatment of uh, CAP and COVID. Thank you all so much, and we hope to see you all next time. Take care. <laughs>